The latent fingerprints found on the screen by Sergeant Barlow are photographed by him and also by the sheriff's office, which sends copies to the State Bureau of Identification in Sacramento. A search of the files in the police department fails to link these latent fingerprints with any on record. And as soon as she is able to be questioned, Mrs. Watson receives a visit from investigating officers at the hospital. Now, Mrs. Watson, can you give us any better description of the man who shot you than the one we have? Well, Lieutenant, he had a scarf around his face, and it was difficult to make out his features. There was one thing that impressed me, though. Hmm, what was that, ma'am? His eyes. He, he drew them into slits when he talked. I see. Do you think you would recognize him if you saw him again? Yes. I believe I would. Have you any idea who might have held you up? No, I haven't. But it might have been done for revenge. Revenge? Why? Well, you see, Mr. Watson has been quite active in politics around the neighborhood, and he's been responsible for quite a few criminals being sent to San Quentin. Several of them have been threatened to get even. Mm, I see. Well, that is a possibility. We'll look into that angle of the case. <laughs> Several days go by, and police are unable to connect the crime with any of Mr. Watson's potential enemies, or with any of the records on file. Then in a rooming house on South Hope Street occurs an incident which is destined to have great bearing on the case. I tell you, Mrs. Dennis, this has got to stop. I'm moving out. Sure, and what is it now, Mr. Fitz? Now, it's my pants. Ah, sure, Mr. Fitz, be praised. What's the matter with your pants? Do you want them patched, baby? No, I don't want them patched. They haven't got them to be patched. Well, now, where are they, Mr. Pitt? They've been stolen. Stolen, is it? Yes, yeah, stolen. And I know oh, who did it. And who? Well, uh, I think I know. It's that Christian fellow in room 105. And what makes you think he took them? Because I saw him wearing them this morning. The devil you say. Yeah. Well, I won't have goings on like that in my house. Now, you come along with me, and we'll see about it. Uh, well, what are you going to do? Well, we're going to talk to Mr. Preston about this time. Oh, how long now? Uh, 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 I never had to spend the night in my house. I never had a place like this. Are you, Mr. Preston? Uh, yeah, who is it? It's Mrs. Giddes. Oh, come in. Oh, good afternoon, Mrs. Giddes. Mr. Preston, whose pants is them? Why, they're mine. No, they're not, young man. They belong to me. You stole them. I did not steal them. I bought them from Jimmy Black. Well, they're my pants. Oh, I didn't know they was hot. I wouldn't have bought them. Mrs. Guinness, I don't believe this young man's story. Yeah, well, it doesn't sound fair to me either. And I'm going to get to the bottom of it. What do you mean? Young man, I run a decent house here. And I don't want the likes of you into it. Okay, I'll move. Not with my pants I on. I know you'll move. And if you'll be in the police patrol, you'll be moving. Huh. I've been missing things around my place, too. And I'm going to find out who's been taking them or know the reason why. And so Jimmy Preston is arrested and lodged in the county jail on suspicion of robbery. His fingerprints are sent to Sacramento and police are elated to receive a reply from the State Bureau of Identification that they bear a general similarity to the prints found on the screen at Mrs. Watson's house. Sergeant Barlow immediately checks the prints and discusses his findings with a brother officer. Why, it's ridiculous. There's no point of identity between the latents we found on this man's prints. Yeah, but he might be the same man, mightn't he? Not a chance. Well, just the same, I'm going to take him over to the hospital and see if Mrs. Watson can identify him. And you're just wasting your time. Yeah, maybe, but it's worth a try. Now, Mrs. Watson, is this the man that held you up? It's so hard to be sure. But then, you've always found his fingerprints are the same, haven't you? Well, Sacramento reports a similarity. Listen, lady, I don't know what this is all about, but I know this much. I never saw you before in my life. Yes, Lieutenant. I'm sure now that this is the man. Notice the way his eyes draw down to slips? He's the one, all right. Say, lady, you don't know what you're saying. You're railroading me. You sent an innocent guy to the pen. I never done nothing to you. Well, the night that guy plugged you, I was in jail in San Diego. I should think, young man, when you're thinking up a... Oh, what do you call it? Oh, oh yes, alibi. That you've 
have enough pride not to lie about being in jail elsewhere. <laughs> what difference does it make where I was? I didn't do nothing to you. This is the man, Lieutenant. There's no doubt about it. And men of his type should be in prison. I'll do everything I can to cooperate with you. I'll help in every way to see that he's sent there for good. And I hope it will be a lesson to you, young man. <laughs> sentence you to serve from 11 years to life in San Quentin prison. Now I tell you, Chief, this is one of the most outrageous miscarriages of justice I've ever heard of. Ah, quiet down, Sergeant. Let me get the straight of this. Begin at the beginning. This man, Preston's prints, bear a general resemblance and outline to those I found on the screen at the Watson home. Yeah. But they are not identical. There is not one single point of similarity. Why, Preston is no more guilty of this crime than you or I. Well, I don't know what you can do about it. You've had your chance. I had no chance, sir. The first I knew of his trial was when I read it this afternoon's paper that he'd been sentenced. I was never subpoenaed to appear. You weren't? No. They convicted that man on Mrs. Watson's general identification and the general similarity of prints. Why, it's ridiculous. Oh, he, wait a minute. He could... Wait a minute, young fella. Don't go off the deep end. Well, it makes me burn. We've got to do something about it, Chief. We can't let an innocent man go to prison. There isn't much we can do about it. Judgment has been passed. And it isn't fair. Well, there's only one thing for you to do now, then. What's that, sir? Find the man who left his fingerprint on Mrs. Watson's screen. If you can find the real criminal and convict him on your fingerprint evidence... Then you can free Preston. And in the meantime, Preston has to go to San Quentin for a crime of which he is innocent. I'm afraid so, Sergeant. Very well, then. I'm going to find the real criminal if I have to go over every single one of the 300,000 prints in our files. For the next year and a half, Barlow, the police officer who works by exact science, rather than the undependable emotionality of witnesses, checks and rechecks his ponderous pile of fingerprints. Every burglar suspect brought in for questioning is fingerprinted, and his prints are compared with the marks left on Mrs. Watson's screen. Still, nothing comes of the patient's search. Only the thought of justice that he alone can bring to an innocent man immured in San Quentin spurs Barlow to his Herculean task. in 1926, nearly two years after Mrs. Watson was shot, an apparently unrelated incident occurs. Several burglary jobs have been pulled by a man who operates in a Ford Coupe, license number 125380. The police bulletin describes the car and orders all officers to be on the lookout for it. On April 18th, a squad car is cruising through the sparsely settled southwest section of town. Stay, partner. Slow down a bit. I want to give this Ford the once over. Yeah, it might be stolen, huh? Yeah, you never can tell. The car parked by a vacant lot out in this godforsaken neighborhood's parked there for no good. License 125380. Got that on the hot sheet? Yeah, just a minute until I see. Yes, by gosh, here it is. That's the car wanted in connection with those burglary jobs. Yeah. Say, if we knock this baby over, maybe they'll put us in plain clothes. You never can tell. You'd better pull up there ahead of him. Okay. Ah. Yeah. How's this? Fine. We can keep our eye on him through the rear vision mirror. Now, when he gets in the Ford, let him drive by us and then force him into the curb. Okay. What if he starts shooting? That's all I want. If he starts shooting, I let him have it. And the taxpayers are spared the expense of trying him. Yeah, what a vigilante you are. Rope in justice, huh? Sure, why not? Policing rats like these guys cost the people too much dough. Okay. Stole the frontier ideas. Here comes our guy. Swell. He's getting into the car now. He's rolling. Let's go. All right, get over there. Over the curb. Hey, what's the big idea? Up with your hands. Reach. And keep them there. Hey, what is this? Shut up. Get out of the car. 
Get out. Hey, keep your hands up. I'll open the door. All right, frisk him, partner, while I keep him covered. Okay. Uh-huh. Here's a forty-five in his pocket. Uh, oh, oh, well, a nice, shiny forty-five in a leg holster. Uh, look here, you guys. I can explain this. Yeah, but... I know. You were using these to hunt goldfish. Sure. Well, save your breath for headquarters. You'll have plenty of explaining to do down there. The suspect who says his name is Carroll is brought in, fingerprinted, and booked on suspicion of robbery. Sergeant Barlow checks his prints against those found in the recent holdups and faces the man with these facts. Well, Carol, are you ready to confess? Confess what? Oh, you know that better than we do. Well, maybe I do, but you guys are paid to find out things. Suppose you find out something about me. Very well, we'll show you how far we've gotten. Barlow, suppose you tell Carol what we know about him. Well, Carol, on December 29th, you burglarized the home of Charles McInnes on Glendale Boulevard. On July 4th, you broke into W. Barker's house on Western Avenue. And on January 2nd, you committed the burglary at 5012 Beverly Boulevard. Shall I go on? Or are you convinced? How do you know all that? Fingerprints. You left a nice set of prints on every one of those jobs. Ah, uh, fingerprints don't prove anything. No? Well, we think they do. Yeah? Well, not a lot you know about them. If I told you what I know about fingerprints, an innocent guy would be sprung from San Quentin. What do you mean? Oh, uh, Nothing. What innocent man are you talking about? Oh, some guy that got mixed up in a robbery and shooting a couple of years ago. Who do you mean? Preston? I've said all I'm going to say. Well, maybe that was too much, Carol. Maybe you're the man I've been looking for for a year and a half. Barlow, the end of his long search in sight, rushes back to his office to compare those window screen prints for perhaps the last time. Elated with what he discovers, he bursts into the chief's office. Oh, well, chief, I found him. Found who? Well, the man who shot Mrs. Watson. Yeah? Yes, sir. Look at these prints. Oh. Identical, aren't they? Yep. Exact duplicates. 25 or 30 points of similarity. More than four times enough for a conviction. Who is the man? Name's Carroll, alias the weasel. Has he confessed? No, he refuses to admit or deny anything. Now, chief, how can we get Preston out of San Quentin? Yeah, it's going to be hard to do. And we've got to have a tight case. Well, what tighter case would you want than these prints? True, true. But first, the victim should be convinced. You mean uh, Mrs. Watson? Yes. Let's see if we can get an identification from her. How? By pictures? Yeah. We'll go out to see her and take her half a dozen mugs of convicts. Ask her to pick out the one that looks like the man who shot her. Then see if she picks out Carol's picture. Okay, Chief. Let's go up right now, huh? <laughs> Watson, I never bothered you about it before, but I've always felt that an innocent man was sent to prison in that shooting case of yours last year. An innocent man? Yes. I was never satisfied that Preston's fingerprints were the same as the ones on your screen. Oh, but Mr. Barlow, that couldn't be. Why, I read in the paper that his fingerprints were the same, and naturally when I saw him, I... Oh, well, maybe I was influenced by the story in the paper. Well, the story in the paper was incorrect. Now, we think that we have the criminal in custody, and we want you to help us. Why, of course, I'd be glad to help you in any way I can. Very well. Now, here are ten pictures of criminals from our mug books. Do any of these men look like the fellow who held you up and shot you? Well, now, wait until I put my glasses on. Uh, there. That's better. Now, let's see. No, that's nothing like him. Oh, no, not that one. No, that's not him. Oh, wait a minute. Here he is. Yes, I'm sure that's him. See how the eyes squint? That's just the way he looked at you. You see that, Chief? She picked out the picture of Carol. Mrs. Watson, you're right this time. This man's fingerprints match exactly the prints left on your screen. And you mean that the man in San Quentin is innocent? Yes, Mrs. Watson, he is. Oh, how terrible. Believe me, Sergeant, you can count on me to do anything I can to make up this terrible injustice to the poor man. <laughs> Superintendent of the State Bureau of Identification at Sacramento is asked to express an opinion on the Carroll prints and replies to Barlow that he is convinced that Carroll and not Preston is guilty of the attack upon Mrs. Watson. 
Barlow engages upon a voluminous correspondence with Preston in San Quentin, with the governor, and with the judge who sentenced Preston. The machinery set in motion for Preston's parole. Barlow appears in the office of the district attorney. Now, I've sent you a statement of the facts in this case, sir. And now I'm prepared to ask you for a complaint charging Carroll with burglary, robbery, and assault with a deadly weapon with intent to kill. You think you have a case? Yes, sir. I've identified Carroll with six jobs, including the Watson job. The bullet taken from Mrs. Watson's body was shot from the same type of gun as found on Carroll. Uh, what does Carroll say? Well, he refuses to talk. And he's in the general hospital now for sanity observation. The doctors believe that he may be a victim of dementia precox. But I think he's just faking to try to beat the rap for a stretch of patent. Now, I know this man is guilty. I have all the proof necessary to convict him, and I want you to prosecute him. Until Preston is freed from San Quentin and Carroll takes his place, we can't claim to have any justice in this state. Well, from what you've reported to me, Sergeant, I believe Carroll's guilty, all right. Then you'll issue the complaint? Yes, I will. And I'll prosecute the case myself. <laughs> and a half after he had entered the state penitentiary, the great gates of San Quentin open on James Preston, and he emerges a free man. He hastens to Los Angeles to meet personally the man who has worked with such untiring effort in his behalf. Gee, Sergeant, I, I don't know how to thank you. I can't have any bowls that would do what you've done for me. Oh, that's all right, Jimmy. I was convinced from the first that you were innocent, and I wasn't going to let you stay up there without fighting about it. Maybe you don't know how it feels to be in my spot, to be free, out in the open again, to, to get a break. I don't know what to say. Well, don't try to say it, Jimmy. I, I think I know what you mean. A great injustice has been done to you, and I don't know how we're ever going to make it up to you. But the boys in the department have made up a little purse. Now, it isn't much, but maybe it'll help you get started. We want you to just accept it as, as our way of saying we're sorry you had to go up there. Gee. Uh, the chief has arranged a job for you at the Ford plant. You can start to work next week. Gee, and I used to think that the coppers was rats. So did the police try to make some sort of retribution to Jimmy Preston. As to Carroll, he was found to be suffering from catatonic dementia precox and was sent to Patton. Later, he was brought back and tried on charges of burglary, robbery, and assault with a deadly weapon with intent to commit murder. He pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. After trial by four different juries, he was found sane at times crimes were committed, and he was sentenced to San Quentin Penitentiary for five to fifty years. Calling All Cars is a presentation of the Rio Grande Oil Company. Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline is the police preferred gasoline wherever it's sold. You can get police car performance from your car by patronizing your independent Rio Grande dealer. Sinclair Motor Oils are companion products of Rio Grande Gasoline. The American Automobile Association states that poor oil costs $40 million per year in damages and attendant repairs to American automobile motors and machinery. Why should motorists buy cheap bullock oil at 15 cents to 25 cents per quart, not knowing how long it has been stored in dirty tanks? Sinclair Opaline is subjected to seven extra refining processes. It is made from mid-continent's oldest crude oil and costs only 25 cents per quart. Sold only in extra measure, tamper-proof cans. Don't gamble with your investment in your automobile when you can have positive motor protection with Sinclair Opaline at only 25 cents per quart at independent service stations. <laughs> Please calling all cars. Attention all cars. Cancellation broadcast 41 regarding a holdup. And that's all for Olsen Close. Oh, Sergeant, what's the matter? Calling all cars is written and produced by William N. Robeson. The orchestra is conducted by Frederick Stark. And this is Frederick Lindsley saying...